So, I recently saw a military aviation history video on electronic slash electromagnetic warfare, and it was broadly quite good, but it suffers from two of the same problems that most of the videos and discussions in general I've seen on the subject seem to suffer from, which is it doesn't really clearly define the sort of overall picture of electronic warfare, and it neglects the most important development in electronic warfare during my lifetime, which is the advent of stealth. <laughs> which, you might not immediately think of stealth as a component of electronic warfare, but it is, right? And it's the big game-changing thing that everybody says it is, but of course I am in agreement with the people that say that we're being a little bit... Uh, too bold and putting all our eggs in the stealth basket, but stealth is absolutely an aspect of electronic warfare, right? Because electronic warfare is all about using the electromagnetic spectrum, especially the radio frequency portion, right? Because electromagnetic waves are all, well, electromagnetic waves, right? Everything from gamma rays, which are very, very short wavelengths, uh, through optical wavelengths, you know, ordinary light, uh, through infrared wavelengths, through down to radio wavelengths and radio frequencies, which are very low frequency, very long wavelength, uh, electromagnetic radiation and photons. And, well, stealth is all about making it so that you cannot be detected via using the electromagnetic spectrum, primarily by reducing the radar cross-section, but also by reducing the infrared emissions due to the engine temperature. And I don't know why it seems to get left out, but it, it's really better to think about it as a part of an overall whole. And in his video, Bismarck, the I think old screen handle of the military aviation history guy, his actual name is just Chris, I think. Uh, he said, you know, there's electronic support, electronic protection, and electronic attack. Um, and then sort of nebulously describes how some of those things interplay with each other. But I am going to create my own sort of set of octants uh, for analyzing electronic warfare, especially how stealth fits into it, because, well, let me move over so that I can uh, fit my own little uh, diagram onto the screen here. So we're going to break things down into eight categories based on three sort of variables, right? So the first variable is there things can be used either for sensing, aka radar and infrared search and track, or for communications, and with aka radio and data link traffic. And then within each of those, we have these sort of four quadrants to consider. There's active and passive, and what I mean by that is specifically, are you actively emitting and, gener and intentionally actively emitting electromagnetic radiation, or are you simply receiving and detecting electromagnetic radiation and then there's offensive and defensive and i don't mean that with regards to is the overall mission either tactically or strategically offensive or defensive i mean are you attempting to execute a kill chain against an aircraft or are you attempting to defend against a kill chain against an aircraft and that also generally corresponds with, are you trying to use the electromagnetic spectrum as part of that kill chain, or are you trying to deny the enemy the use of the electromagnetic spectrum as part of that kill chain, which would be the defensive side. So we'll start off with what this whole reason for me wanting to discuss this is, which is stealth, right? So stealth is in the passive and defensive quadrant of the uh, sensing side of things. So we're going to discuss the whole sensing side, and then we'll discuss the communication side. So stealth is a passive way of defending yourself against 
enemy use of the electromagnetic spectrum because you're defending yourself against being detected by radar by having a small radar cross-section and also protecting yourself against enemy passive infrared sensors by having a small infrared signature. And so you'll notice that there's also something else in that quadrant. In fact, there's two other things, right? There's, first of all, you can also use terrain to do this, right? You can just fly low, although that puts you in range of other anti-aircraft weapons. So that's, you know, turned out to not be a particularly good way to do things. The, this was tried uh, in the 80s and uh, during the first Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm, it turned out to not be a particularly effective strategy because it just makes uh, those airplanes too vulnerable to anti-aircraft artillery and shoulder-fired anti-aircraft weapons. But there's also CHAF, right, which is another passive defensive system and it's been around since world war ii and it's not as effective as stealth but it's still very much a part of electronic warfare and that actually did get uh, a mention in the video by military aviation history which is in some sense why it's peculiar that uh, he didn't mention this sort of game-changing development of stealth um, but conversely people when people are discussing stealth they don't seem to discuss the rest of the sort of electronic warfare picture, including simple things like chaff and terrain masking. So then let's look at the other quadrants here, right? So the sort of active but defensive side is probably the most canonical aspects of electronic warfare and what people typically think of when they think of electronic warfare, right? Which is uh, active jamming of enemy radars, right? And as was discussed in the video and many other places, jamming has the tremendous downside that it lets the enemy know that something is up, right? It sort of, you know, blinds the enemy radar, but it also lets them know that you are planning to do something. And also jamming, it's, you're, you're effectively blinding the enemy radar, right? Um, so it's like, you can very easily tell which direction a jamming signal is coming from because you know it'd be like i guess i'm gonna saturate oh this won't be bad for, too bad for my phone's camera uh, but if i point a flashlight straight at the the camera right it washes out everything else in the field of view and you can't see anything right so it makes it hard hard to see it but say you all what you can do is you can just narrow your field of view right so now you can't see the flashlight but now you can well now you know which direction that jamming is coming from. You can't see anything but the jamming signal, but you can see that pretty easily. And you might have other assets in range of the jamming asset that can take it out. Like you might have your own fighters airborne that you can vector towards that jamming signal. And there's another form of jamming too, which is sort of more ubiquitous, right? Which is just sort of a, a jamming pod that's great because you can have a dedicated jamming platform that blinds a radar like that but you can also have a simple jamming pod that basically just um it's not directing a beam of energy to blind a radar but it's just sort of sending out a signal that's much brighter than a radar right so you know imagine the flashlight again is is like a you know a radar beam and i'm trying to you know get you know, a signal by getting a reflection off of my hand here. Well, now imagine instead I also have this lamp up, right? Now it becomes uh, very difficult to distinguish the two, right? It's like, am I looking at the lamp or am I looking at the reflection? And it still, you still know which direction it's coming from. Uh, but what it does is it makes it basically impossible to get any ranging or distance information. And so if you've ever played DCS, you'll be familiar with just using the jammer that way. And that brings us over to the active and offensive side, right? Which is that jamming is, can be essentially overridden, right? Because jamming works by being insanely bright. Um, but uh, let's see, where are my sunglasses here? So, but one thing it can do, as you can imagine, let's see, I'm not sure how well this will actually work, but... Like if I put my sunglasses in front of the uh, in front of the lens here, now it's much dimmer, and now, well, yeah, it's actually still too bright. I, I'd have to go get uh, oh, let me go get my eclipse glasses. That will be better. One second. So here I have my eclipse glasses, right? So you can just you know, and so it'll it'll black things out completely. But now you can see 
when I flash the flashlight right towards the camera, you can still see it, right? So you can do the same thing, but with radio waves, right? You can just basically make your antenna like crappy on purpose, right? You can add an attenuator and you can see which direction the signal is coming from. And if your own, it's it would be starting to get too complicated to use the laser pointers and do a whole demo with this. But basically if you have a intense enough radar beam and you're close enough to your target, you can burn through a jammer, right? And you can get a radar return that's stronger than the jamming signal. And so you can do counter jamming where you just are emitting so much radar energy and you're so close to your target that you go right through it. And you can actually also use this to defeat stealth. Um, but of course it relies on the same thing, which is you have to be really close, right? You can detect a, you know, they say stealth airplanes have like the radar cross section of like, you know, a little honeybee or something, right? But if you're, you know, like less than a kilometer away from a honeybee, you could easily pick that up with a radar, right? And so stealth is, even more difficult to defeat than jamming, uh, but it can be defeated. Um, with stealth, you have the, also the caveat that it's harder to, to burn through a jammer with just more power from a distance because you also have to deal with the fact that you're going to get radar returns from the clouds and dust and everything else. And so just pumping out more transmitter power won't like defeat stealth, but being close to the uh, stealthy aircraft will, right? But nobody says that, well, Let's try to, well, people always try to emphasize that stealth does not mean invisible, right? It just means harder to see. And so then that finally brings us to the set of passive but offensive systems, right? And this is the other thing that is really, really important in light of the development of stealth, right? We're, and remember, we're still just on the sensing side of things, so we haven't even touched on the communication side. But so, and you'll notice that there's things here that don't seem very passive. There's, you know, anti-radiation missiles, which are definitely very active in the sense of the, you know, their actual kinetic weapons, right? Everything else here is some terp sort of, you know, sensors and radios and things like that. And this is the only thing that's an actual explosive. <laughs> um, but remember, it's passive in the sense that it does that anti-radiation weapons do not emit any radio waves, right? They look for enemy radio waves and they just seek them out. Um, and so in that sense, they are passive. But the major development is that airplanes like the F-35 are designed with the idea that you don't ever want to turn on your own radar, radar if you can possibly avoid it. Because as soon as you do, your own radio, you know, your you know, forget about enemy radar reflecting off of you, you're just emitting electromagnetic radiation in the radio frequency range, and the enemy can pick that up, right? So rather than emit radio emission, RF emissions with your own active radar, why not just sit back and listen for enemy radar transmissions coming in and pick those up with various antennas located around the aircraft and use that to build up a picture of where enemy aircraft and ground-based air defenses might be located. And then in addition to that, there's the infrared search and track that the F-35 has, which this little model isn't quite detailed enough to have that, but it's, you know, located on the nose here, so primarily looking down at the ground. Um, I mean, it's sort of looking, you know, forward and down. But that also is a passive sensor that does not emit any electromagnetic radiation, but nevertheless is capable of detecting targets. So that's everything in the sensing side of things, which is, that is by no means an exhaustive discussion of those things, but I'm trying to keep this to a semi-reasonable length. And again, everything is sort of, you know, stealth, 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 right? And jamming can be very nicely complementary to stealth, but generally you don't want to jam when you're sending in stealthy airplanes because that will just let the enemy know that you're doing something and let them know to start looking to see if they can find your stealth airplanes because remember they're not invisible, they're just difficult to detect. But it still can be useful like once you know you can have jamming assets that are standing by and then you know you the stealth airplanes you know when they know they've been found can let the jamming asset know over data link hey they already detected us go ahead and start jamming now uh and you know it gets very complicated and i'm 
basing this all on open source information and my basic knowledge of physics and engineering. So you could get a lot more detailed than this, but uh, in the sake of for the sake of brevity, let's now move on to the other side of things, which is communications. Uh, so I guess I've changed up the color scheme here uh, because we're moving sections. So now we're cyan and magenta instead of red and blue. Although we're still going to do the high saturation, low saturation for passive and active. Um, so now we're talking about communications, right? Which, you know, is just, you know, in addition to... In addition to good old-fashioned voice communications. <laughs> I, I had to get that in there. Uh, is also data link, right? And... There's a bunch of things to consider here. And so you'll notice that uh, stealth is still on the menu, <laughs> right? Because you need to consider that stealth is still a part of the overall communications picture, right? The ability to obscurate what you are doing as a whole is still broadly under the communications category. But you notice the other thing that's right there with it, which is emissions control, right? And the reason I have both of those there is that emissions control has always existed, right? You don't want to be constantly chattering away on your radio, whether it's voice communications, which is still the most important thing, or data link, which is very, very important, although they both use encrypted data link to send the information, whether it's sending digital data to directly send into another aircraft's targeting computer, or if it's sending voice communications, they're both going to be sent encrypted over data link. And doing that necessarily means you are at risk of being detected, because again, you're sending out RF emissions, radio frequency. That means somebody might detect those, see which direction it's coming from, and find out you're there. And then they might start up the process of getting a kill chain together to get get a radar lock, get a firing solution, get a missile in range and fire it at you, and you don't want that because you don't want your airplane to get blown up. So with stealth airplanes, emissions control becomes much more important than it used to be with non-stealthy airplanes, because non-stealthy airplanes, at a certain point, you know you're probably being picked up on radar anyways, so it's more important to just use your data, data and voice communication channels to coordinate your actions than it is to try to keep your RF emissions down, but there are still some things you can do. And so you'll notice what I have in the active, active but defensive side of things is the use of high gain data links, right? So what I mean by high gain is I just mean uh, very, very highly directional, right? So, you know, it's, oh my goodness, this flashlight's spazzing out on me. So, you know, it would be like, you know, uh, the difference between like this, right, where you see a very narrow, fairly narrow focused beam or you know like yeah like this where you have it super wide and it's just kind of going all over the place right and you really want uh, in fact it, you want it quite a bit narrower than this flashlight you want it it would be you know at least as narrow as like a laser say where you know there's just this tiny little point and if you're not looking right at that point um you don't see anything and high gain data links facilitate being able to use communications without necessarily informing the enemy of your location. And again, the exact details of all these systems are classified, but high gain antennas have been around for a long time. And also in the United States in particular, because we have so many uh, space-based assets, you know, space-based communications systems, right? You can just aim all of your emissions straight up, right? And unless there happens to be an enemy aircraft flying right over top of you, which could happen, it would be very much not your lucky day, <laughs> you can be reasonably assured of being able to use communica your communications and data link systems without being detected. And also on the defensive side of things, we still have jamming, right? Just the same as with radar, you can just blind, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, you just <laughs> make so much noise that uh, my mic is over here instead of the camera, which is there. Um, you can just, you know, make it so that it's difficult to hear by just making very disruptive sounds. And 
again, same downsides as with active jamming, which was discussed, which was discussed in uh, the video I'm quasi responding to, although not exactly. They, you know, said it's not always the best to jam in any communications because then it lets them know you're there. But it can be very helpful. Um, and so you'll notice on the active side, I actually have then, I said, all data links, right? Because there's a very meaningful sense in which this is part of it too, because communications in modern times uses the electromagnetic spectrum. And it, uh, Chris slash military aviation history got into kind of a philosophical uh, discussion, which was quite interesting, um, even if it has been done to death, but uh, it's warrants being done to death and repeating because it's that important that, yeah, you know, communications and coordination are key, right? And in modern times, that means using the electromagnetic spectrum to do it. Uh, although technically, uh, we've been doing that for a long time, but primarily it used to be, you know, carrying paper messages around or carrying messages around, you know, in people's heads uh, by sending messengers. And that's actually still an important uh, form of communication on the ground because it's much more difficult to intercept. But we've also been using things like signal fires for a long time, right? Like that scene, I guess it's, you know, fantasy, not historical, but right, the scene in Lord of the Rings, right, where they have a bunch of, you know, fires ready to light on a bunch of mountaintops, right? And each one, when they see the previous one, they light the next one. Um, and they can send a very long range signal that way, which is technically a, using the electromagnetic spectrum because it's using uh, visible light, which is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so the use of the RF spectrum to coordinate your attack like say you know you're you know one airplane and there's another airplane uh, and you're you know all in a giant fur ball you know engaging in air-to-air -air combat with enemy airplanes well you're going to want to occasionally hop on the radio and make a transmission to let it you know let your you know uh, mem fellow members of your flight know what you're doing and ask where they are etc cetera, etc cetera. so you're going to want to be able to use the electromagnetic spectrum to do that although again uh, that will make you somewhat more vulnerable but Presumably, if you're already dogfighting or gauging in air-to-air -air combat in general, you've already been detected. Um, so, trade-offs, you know. And, okay, so finally we have the offensive but passive use of communications, which is the other side of everything we, we're talking about, right? Which is, you can intercept enemy communications, and you can use that for two things. One, if they emit radio broadcasts, you can see which direction the radio broadcast come from and know, oh, there's an enemy airplane in that direction. And two, you can actually try to intercept the and decrypt that information as well. And that is actually probably the thing that the video spent the longest time discussing, so that's the thing I'll spend the least time discussing. But uh, suffice it to say, cryptography is very important. Um, that one's a little bit different because that's just not something you ever, you know, most of these things I've discussed are things that you would tend to do more or less in real time as a sort of tactical battle space was developing. Uh, decrypting enemy radio traffic is extremely valuable, but it's not the sort of thing you typically would do in, in real time as a battle is unfolding. It's the sort of thing that would be done at more of a, you know, planning, planning level, you know, possibly a relatively low level, you know, you know squadron or, you know, company or battalion level, but uh, nevertheless, it's it's not like, you know, you do it, you know, during the middle of a dogfight. <laughs> so I think that about wraps that up. Um, there's a lot more discussion that you could have on this subject. It's very important. And uh, I'm going to, for the sake of brevity, I think, uh, stop here. But uh, I could go on and uh, maybe I will elaborate in the future. But uh as always when discussing sort of these various morbid uh, war-based systems. Fortunately, electromagnetic warfare is something that involves a relatively low amount of uh, kinetic weapons, although, uh, you know, this is all about a war-fighting picture, so, uh, you know, don't want any of these things to be anything other than just sort of, uh, you know, ex sort of thinking exercises as a just-in-case. Um, would always be remiss if I did not mention that, but, uh, yeah. Peace.